If you're a chess lover, you're probably aware that the 45th Chess Olympiad is being played right now in Budapest, Hungary, and I've been following it closely. In fact, I've been following the Indian team in general, but specifically Arjun Erigaisi, who's one of my favorite chess players. And in today's video, I'm going to show you his game in his match or on their match against Azerbaijan that left me impressed. With the white pieces, we have Arjun Erigaisi, of course, and with the black pieces, we have Mamedov. Rauf, who's an extremely strong player from Azerbaijan. In this game, uh, Arjun opened up with e4, which is kind of already a little bit of a surprise. According to Chess Base India in his video, or in their video, Arjun usually goes for d4 when he wants to win, but he wants to win with everything and anything, and he's extremely well prepared. Black played c5, demonstrating that they're ready for a fight. Knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. We have ourselves the main line of any Sicilian knight c3 and then black has a choice already here black can choose to play the very sharp Nachtdorf or play what black played in the game which is g6 the dragon the Sicilian dragon now Mamedov is a specialist of this defense when you're a spe specialist it means that you understand the structures you've been playing it for a while and you are predictable in that sense meaning that Arjun probably already knew that Mamedov was going to play this so prepared something Maybe not spectacular, but you will you will get to see during the game. Bishop e3 was played. This is the main line. Bishop g7. F3, preventing knight g4. David, why was not knight g4 played before? This is not working because after bishop b5 check, um, yeah, you are you're you're not doing very well here. So knight g4 is not a threat, but after bishop g7, it kind of is. So you have to play f3. Black plays knight c6. You play queen d2. Castles. And this is where modern theory kind of takes two different ways. You can play queenside castling, but after d5, queen e1, e5, you get into some sort of crazy position where both sides have chances. Bishop c4, this is what people play. Bobby Fischer has been play, has played this before. Uh, people from uh, players from the past have played this before, meaning that this line is well known, but yet it continues to be just objectively good. In this position, black took on d4. Um, bishop d7 was, well, okay, the old line, maybe rook b8, rook c8, the Chinese variation. But knight takes d4 is the modern way of approaching this by Anish Giri's course. Bishop takes d4, bishop e6. You don't want to trade that bishop. That's why Arjun played bishop e3. You trade that bishop black. Black's double pawns are not bad at all. You can look at some grandmaster games there. Bishop b3 was played by Arjun, defending the bishop, of course. Queen a5, queenside castling. And b5. So all of this is theory, and they are kind of blitzing out all of these moves because they are aware of, of, of the theory. There are two players that are in the elite essentially. And yeah, it would be a surprise if they didn't know this position because they've played it before hundreds of times, probably by training matches or by looking at the computer. So b5, everything's pretty logical so far. Black is going for some counterplay in the queen side, but this at the same time it's kind of liquidating the position. Because after king b1, b4, you kind of force white to go knight d5. And after bishop takes, e takes, you are, you are in the position where white has a bishop pair. But black will get to trade these two bishops. Meaning that this knight will be playing against that bishop on a b3. And that bishop on b3, <coughs> sorry, is very often a little bit outplayed or out of, out of play on b3. It's left alone. So, well... We get this position, queen b5, trying to get ro the pawns rolling. By the way, I should have mentioned, knight takes d5 is not as played as bishop takes d5, because after uh, bishop g7, sorry, king takes g7, e takes d5, this position is a little bit trickier to defend as black. In fact, this is already a slight advantage for white, and the only uh, game that is on my database, on the leeches database, is a win for, for white. So this should be, yeah, this, this should be enough to, to you to prove that. People don't go into this, and Mamedov, who, as I said, is a very well-prepared player in the Dragon, does not go for that, goes for Queen b 5 There's still many games, this is still theory, this is still well-known. White plays Queen d 3 trading the Queens, getting out of uh, the venom and danger of that position. Rook takes d 3 Rook f c8, getting ready for maybe some c-file action. a5 is still kind of an idea, of course. Rook e1, targeting e7, and Rook c7. This plan of black with rook c8 and rook c7 is very interesting. Mamilov, specialist, knows this, that 
the main line is knight d7. But do you know what I suspect? I suspect that Mamedov, first of all, demonstrated that he wanted to play for, for an interesting game with c5. But also that after knight d7, this is a little bit too drawish and very well known. After this, black has to find g5. I'm quite sure Mamedov was aware of this. And after something like uh, rook takes e7, you have knight e5, rook b7, rook fb8. And it's kind of heading towards the draw because black has enough compensation for the pawn. But in this position, as I said, rook c8 was played by Mamedov, trying to go for, well, defending the weakness on e7 actively with a rook on c7, getting ready to double on the c-file. And maybe this is going to give him more chances to imbalance the position. But as we're going to see, that's going to backfire a little bit. In this position, Arjun, very well prepared, knows the main line, c3, this is the top engine move. a5, c takes b4, a takes b4. This transformation is mainly for white to not be bored, bothered about a5, a4. So now white, white's bishop on b3 is a little bit less vulnerable. And that's why actually, well, now that these, these bishops have kind of cent uh, central uh, static posts, Arjun goes for king's at expansion on g4 with g4. Rook a c8, doubling on the c file. There's, I mean, as black, you're kind of waiting as well to see what white does. White go goes rook 3 d1. Reason being that if you try to go g5 first, claiming that knight d7, you take a pawn, you're getting checkmated in the first rank, back rank. So rook 3 d1 first, now g5 is kind of a threat. Bishop h6 played, preventing that, and also getting ready for bishop f4, maybe bishop e5 in, in a good day, maybe just occupying the dark scores in general. h4, bishop f4, bishop b6, rook b7, and bishop e3. Bishop e3 would have been the idea, but it's a better execution to de-locate, dislocate, sorry, this rook first, and then trade the bishops. Why are you trading the bishops with the bishop or David? Why would Arjun do that? Well, in reality, this bishop on f4 is pretty strong because it's an, a, an annoying place. You can't kick it out with g3. Even if the pawn was still on h2, g3, eh, it's not like achieving anything. This bishop on g7 was already strong. Essentially, in this position, white is happy to have this imbalanced position. But it all depends if black manages to centralize the knight quickly. And we will see that, unfortunately, black doesn't manage. So bishop takes e3, rook takes e3, king f8. In this position... We have transformed the minor pieces. We have a bishop against a knight. As I said, if the knight manages to get to maybe c5, e5 pretty quickly, it's going to be a good position for black. But black has to take time to protect the weaknesses. b4 is a weakness. And maybe the king's expansion is already annoying, which makes this position objectively equal, but practically a little bit difficult to play as black. Bishop a4 was played by Arjun. Rook c5 targeting this weak d5 pawn. Bishop c6, defending that pawn and attacking the rook on b7 at the same time. Rook a7, and this is essentially the losing blunder. Now, let me just remind you a little bit. By this time, or by this move, both players were still in theory. In fact, h4 is the novelty. This is the first time anyone has ever played this position as white. So Arjun's novelty is h4. a4 had been played before uh, with a draw in 2009. But... What I want to say is that both players are familiar with this. And I wouldn't be surprised if Arjun has prepared this middle game in general. Maybe not the moves exactly, but this 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 structure where black has a weakness on b4 and a weakness on e7 and planning to go for a king's that expansion. What do, I, what do I mean with all of this? What I mean is that Arjun was very confident when he was he got into this position. Or this is what I think. I don't know for sure. I don't know Arjun, right? I wish. But I think that he was pretty confident with this. And that's why he went for it. Bishop a4. He understood that if he put a bishop on c6, this is both an offensive and defensive piece. And already here, black failed to find the best move. The best move was rook b6. And then after rook b3, you can play a e6, kind of undermine this. But rook a7 is a big mistake. Why? Because b4 is now even weaker. So now it's no one's defending it. So after g5, knight d7, and rook d4, this pawn is going to fall soon. g5 had to be played directly, by the way. If you play rook d4 uh, uh, directly, e5 would have been a problem. And after rook takes b4, knight takes d5. So you want to move that knight away first. Knight d7, rook d4, knight b6. If you try to go knight e5, you just take, you transform this position, which is something that we're going to see in the game, where white has a winning 
rook endgame after a3. Now, you have to be careful how you push these pawns. If you go b4, which is a mistake I did while analyzing this game, already rook c a6 would be back to equality. But a3 is already an a slight advantage for white. Why? Because the pawns are quicker than black's pawns. Black's, well, past pawn is the one on d. It's not too obvious to create another past pawn, right? White's pawns, that's the reason why Arjun went for this king's side expansion. The pawns on g5 and h4 are limiting black's pawns meaning that black won't be able to create a pass one so easily. So a3, b4, white's pawns are rolling quicker. And this is an endgame that constantly looms around and it's always a possibility. So knight d7, uh, rook d4, knight b6 was chosen by Mamadov. Rook b3 attacking this pawn twice. If you go for this, this would be a similar endgame. But rook b3 is even more classy. e5, black is trying to defend actively. By this move, of course, you're not going to take en passant. You would lose the bishop. So white is forced to take the, the pawn on b4. 9 takes d5, rook b8, and you transform to that exam, exact rook endgame. Meaning that black is in trouble. Why? Because black does have a passed pawn, but white has two passed pawns. Not only that, but the king is quite well placed. The white king is quite well placed to stop any rook from getting to the... to the... to behind the pawns. Sorry. So white trades one pair of rooks by force rook takes b7 rook takes b7 trading the rooks is a good decision one because if you manage to trade pieces and get to this endgame where black has less chances to create counterplay meaning that if black had both rooks it would be easier for black to create counterplay so trading pieces is a good idea when you have two pass pawns and your opponent only has one specifically in this position now the reason why it's a forced trade is that well if black tries to prevent this you play rook d7 and good luck supping two rooks from from well uh, yeah attacking f7 simultaneously it's 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 it, black is in trouble black's rooks don't manage to coordinate well you will ma maybe you can find a way to protect this but either way it's 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 going to be difficult to defend as as, as black maybe maybe b4 i'm not sure actually rook d8 yeah there we go the engine always showing me the way. I feel I feel like the, there's this motive where you're always putting your rooks in the 8th rank and rook g8 is always a problem. So, my goodness, thank goodness that the engine exists. Rook b7, forcing this rook trade, and now it's going to be kind of a straightforward win. Because after rook d4, b4, rook takes h4, you do lose a pawn, but who cares about pawns? And it, well, who cares about losing pawns? What you should care about in this endgame is whose pawn is faster. And it turns out that Arjun guys' pawns are faster. If you go rook a3, by the way, rook b5, very classy move. If you go rook a3, you go rook a5. And it doesn't matter, like, of course, taking is, this is a win. Uh, e4, you, you promote 10 times quicker. If you play rook b3, it doesn't matter, you lose this pawn. The last pawn standing is going to become a queen. And there's actually no way to stop that. You can't even sacrifice this rook, which maybe make things complicated. So... Yeah, rook b5, very classy move. e4 was tried by Mamedov, but after a7, e3, and king c2, he didn't want to go for this. Arjun is well known for having good conversion skills. King c2, after e2, king d2, there's nothing to be done, so in this position, black resigned the game. I was very impressed with this, and the reason why I'm saying that this is a very perfectly executed Yugoslav attack is because Arjun just played the whole main line and still managed to win. When you're studying chess at at least my level, 2000, I would think, when you, when you're starting to study th opening theory, you're 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 spending so much energy and time into memorizing lines and understanding some structures. And when you finally do know everything, you would expect to to have all of that time and, and investment to pay off. You would expect that to pay off. That's what I mean. So from Mamedov's side of things, he 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 knows his line. He's been playing the dragon for such a long time, and still manages to lose. Not only not not because he failed to memorize any line. He 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 just he just blundered in one move. He just failed to understand that the rook had to protect b4. He thought that it was good enough to go a7, and b4 could have been pr protected actively or tactically. But that was that was one mistake, and it was over. 
And that's what separates Grandmasters from Super Grandmasters or top elite players. That one mistake is good enough for them to win a game. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, any suggestions, if you want me to cover any other game from the Olympiad, please let me know. And as always, have a nice day.